good to see you here this morning. Everybody doing all right? All right. Thankful to be gathered together as God's people. And uh, we're thankful to have you here with us. And we're thankful for those of you who are joining us online as we spend some time together in God's Word. We're going to be in Mark chapter 8. So go ahead and find your copy of God's Word and find your way there to Mark chapter 8. Over the last few weeks, we have been in a series called Renew. And I'm reminded that as we approach the one-year mark, I don't want to call it an anniversary because I don't want to give it that kind of, uh, that level of honor, you know, the one-year mark from when we had to change our worship services. So March 15th, if you will, was the first weird weekend. So March 8th was the last normal weekend, if there's ever been a normal. So we're coming up on the one-year mark of that. Uh, And we have learned that what we do here Gathering together, making disciples, what we do is such a precious thing. And we're thankful to God. I think we were always thankful to God that we could come to church, uh, that we could be a church. But I think losing it makes us more thankful. And so as we come back and we thank God for what he's doing in our church, even how we see him working in our church, then we look at ourselves and we say, how can we renew our commitment to you. How can we renew, God, what you've called us to do? So last week, we talked about renewing a commitment to worship. And this week, it is renewing a commitment to discipleship. So as we think about this idea of renewing a commitment to discipleship, uh, I want to share with you a story from, uh, or really just want to take you back to my days as a football player. Now, when I was a kid, I was, uh, I was convinced that I would be the only running back in NFL history to never be tackled. Okay, I thought that was my goal, and I thought maybe every once in a while they'll push me out of bounds, but I just, I'm too fast. Uh, That didn't work out, if any of you were wondering. However, I did get to play football, and I got to play high school football, and I got to be a running back, and I got tackled quite a bit uh, in doing so. But our offense, I was a running back, that was uh, the position I played most often, and our our offense ran a wing tee. Now, for about 90% of you in the room, that means nothing. That's just for the 10% of you who would want to know who care. We ran a wing tee. But what you need to know for the other 90% is that that means that our linemen would pull and go outside of where they normally would be, and then they, they would lead the way for our running backs. That was basically our offense. And I can hear my coach even to this day. I can close my eyes, and I can hear him, follow your blockers. Get in the hip pocket of that lineman and follow him. Now, that's hard as a running back for a couple of reasons. First of all, you're usually faster than the offensive lineman. And if you want to, you can get ahead of them. And number two, they're usually bigger than you, and you can't really see around them. So it takes a lot of trust. You have to get the ball. You kind of have to let the play develop, and you have to watch this big guy in front of you and, and follow them, follow your blockers. Well, that brings me to this idea of discipleship because I want us, as we turn our hearts and attention to discipleship, I want us to think about what it really is. I spoke to a few folks last week, just kind of said, hey, when the word, you hear the word discipleship, what comes to your mind? And probably like many of you, when they hear the word discipleship, uh, they think, well, being a discipleship makes me think of being a more committed Christian. And and it was kind of like, well, there are two classes of Christians. There are the normal Christians, and then there are the super Christians, and we call those disciples. Like, there's the discipleship thing. And then for some people, it was more like, well, it's, it's kind of like a set of classes. You know, there's more intense training. There's deeper Bible study, deeper study of the Bible. But I really want today to reset the way that we think about discipleship. I want us to think, when we hear the word discipleship, I don't want us to think of a class. And I certainly don't want us to think of a class for the super Christians, like, well, that's where the really dedicated Christians go. No, I want us to think about it this way. Discipleship is really all about following. Discipleship, in fact, is just simply following Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Let me say that again. Discipleship is following Jesus. Jesus. To follow Jesus is to be a disciple. To be a disciple is to follow Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Mark chapter 8, what we have is, I believe, the quintessential statement about discipleship. Coming from the lips of Jesus himself, Mark chapter 8, verse 34, says this, And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow 
me. Discipleship is following Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. You know what that means? That means if you've taken one step in following Jesus, then that means that you've taken a step of discipleship. That also means if you've taken 10,000 miles worth of steps in following Jesus, guess what? There are 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 100,000 steps ahead of you. You are following Jesus. So if you're here today and you've taken one step in following Jesus, that also means there's somebody behind you who hasn't yet taken that step. And so you have a responsibility in discipleship to help that person who's behind you to turn around and say, hey, you should take this step in following Jesus. And to help those people who are beside you who need to take the same step that you do. And just you lock arms together and you follow Jesus together. Discipleship is following Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. When we really change the way that we think about discipleship in this way, it really frees all of us up to make disciples. No longer do you have to be an expert, like, like, well, to lead a discipleship class, I mean, you know, you can lead a life group, that's one thing, but to lead a discipleship class, my goodness, I mean, you probably have to go to seminary four or five times just to be able to do that. No, no, we are making disciples. There are people who need to take the steps that we've already taken, and we can help them do so. Discipleship is following Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. And if we're going to commit to being and making disciples, we have to understand what that means. So let's unpack it. In this passage, I see at least five characteristics of discipleship uh, or of following Jesus, if you, if you will. The first one is this. Anyone can be a follower of Jesus. You know, this hit me this week in a way that it never has. I have studied this passage. I've preached this passage. I've taught this passage. But it never hit me until this week when I was studying for this message that Jesus says, if anyone. And I thought, well, maybe this is just a generic statement. Let me study it a little more. And then I realized something else in this passage. Not only does it say, if anyone, but Jesus goes an extra step. See, Jesus has been teaching his disciples. He's just been in conversation with his disciples, kind of on a little bit of a spiritual retreat. They're in the northern, the northernmost part of the promised land. You can't get any farther north in the promised land. They have retreated and withdrawn, as Jesus often would, to invest some time in his disciples. And so they've done that. And so it's just been Jesus and his disciples, just the 12. He's been hanging out with them and teaching them and that kind of thing. But then when this subject comes up, something that the disciples are talking about lends itself to this subject. Jesus says, hey, let me stop for just a moment. And the Bible says he calls the crowd to him. So this is not just the 12. No, Jesus makes sure that the crowd can hear as well. And then he says, if anyone. Jesus extends the invitation to discipleship to anyone who is willing to respond. That's good news for you and me. Because that means that you don't have to be someone special to respond to this call. You know, it's for those who grew up in church, and it's for those who didn't. It's for those who know lots of Bible stories, and it's for those who don't. If you can't keep your Daniel and the lion's den separate from your Jonah and the big fish, it's okay. You can still be a disciple of Jesus. This is for everyone. It's for those who struggle with obvious sins. You know, we have sins and we categorize them. We, we say, well, there are those sins that everybody knows are sins and sins that are outward sins and sins that are not easy to hide. And so those are the obvious sins and those are the real sinners in the world. And then we have the self-righteous sinners, the sins that you're able to hide, the sins that you're able to keep from other people. And for the most part, everybody thinks you're a pretty good gal, you're a pretty good guy, and so you have the self-righteous sinners. Here's the good news. This is for anyone. It's for obvious sinners, and it's for self-righteous sinners. It is for everyone who will respond. Anyone can be a follower of Jesus, and that is no small thing. Think about it. If you came here today, and you've always been identified as one of those people, or one of that person, or this person who does this, and oh, they're that, you can be someone who is primarily identified as a follower of Jesus. That when people look at you, they think not about all of your issues and all of your mess, but they think about the greatest person who's ever walked the face of the earth, the most important person in history, the person who's been written about more, sung about more, talked about more, imitated more than anyone ever in history. That can be your identity. Let's think about this, Tillman's Corner. We have an opportunity to be someone who is identified so much with that person that we are said to be his disciple. That is amazing. (laughs) 
And here's the thing. I'm concerned about those who have the obvious sins and they struggle with obvious sins. But the one thing about folks who struggle with obvious sins is you never have to convince them they're lost. They know they're lost and they know they need to be saved. In a place like this, having the, the benefit that many of you like me had growing up in church. I've been going to church since nine months before I was born. I can count on maybe two hands the number of Sundays pre-COVID that I have been somewhere sitting in a church building. But here's the thing. There is a huge danger in that. It's easy to play the game. You come, you sit next to people who know Jesus. I mean, they really know Jesus. You go to a class with people who really know Jesus. In fact, you can, you can actually go to the super Christian classes. You can do your life group and you can do a discipleship circle. You might even get nominated to serve on a committee. All it takes in a Baptist church to get nominated to serve on a committee is just hang around for a while. It'll happen eventually. You'll be on a committee. That's just the way it works. I was talking with someone earlier about this message and what was on my heart. And this person said, you know what? That was me. I played the game. I played the Christian game. I played the church game. I even went on mission trips and built churches. Do you know you could go on mission trips and build churches and not really be a disciple of Jesus? Not really be a follower of Jesus? And it's dangerous because if you think, well, I'm good. I build churches. But here's what I want you to see. You can build a thousand churches. Can you imagine standing before God and God saying, why, why should you be a part of my kingdom? You say, well, I built those churches. How many did you build? I built a thousand churches. How many churches do you have to build before you equal the sacrifice of God's only son, his death, burial, and his resurrection? So you couldn't build a million, two million, three million churches. You couldn't go to enough life groups, lead enough discipleship circles, go on enough mission trips. You just couldn't do it. And there's a danger in growing up in the environment where we have been so blessed with. There are benefits certainly that come along with it, but there's a huge danger of growing up and just assuming that you're in because you're in. Everybody around you is in. So we've got to be careful of saying anyone... Jesus said, I want the crowd here, but disciples, I want you to hear this. In fact, this statement is in direct response to Peter. Oh, it's hard to beat Peter. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this. Peter is the first one to sign up on the mission trip. Peter is the first one to lead the discipleship circle. Peter is the one in your life group that you can't get to stop talking so you can teach the lesson. That is Peter. And Jesus says this in response to Peter. You better understand something, Peter. If anyone's going to come after me, that's you, Peter. If anyone's going to come after me, deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. This is for anyone. There's five characteristics in this passage. That's the first. The second is this. Following Jesus means taking yourself off the throne of your heart. And boy, this is, the, this is it. This is the core of what Jesus is saying here. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself. That's a strong statement. Such a strong statement that Jesus, uh, Mark uses it twice in his gospel. He uses it to talk about in this moment, deny yourself. But this is also the same word that, Peter used, that Mark uses to describe Peter's denial. You remember Peter, right? Um, got, uh, they come to him and Jesus is, is on trial, headed for crucifixion. It's pretty clear that this is not going to end well. And so they come to Peter and they say, oh, you, you know Jesus. Peter says, I don't know him. You're wrong. I want to distance myself from this man. They come back to him. No, no, no. I'm telling you, I saw you with him. You didn't see me with him. That was not me. I do not know him. And then the third time they come to him, and the Bible says he cursed, and he said, I do not know the man. I want to be disconnected in any way and every way from this person, Jesus. If that's what it means to deny Jesus, then what does it mean to deny ourselves? What it means to deny ourselves is say, I'm cutting all ties with myself. I am no longer in charge. I am no longer the boss. That old me is dead. It is gone away with. It is no longer me who sits on the throne of my heart. I am now here, and he, Jesus, is there. So to deny ourselves means to take ourselves off the throne of the heart, to give, all, uh, give up any claim upon ourselves. My life is no longer mine. I'm no longer the boss. If you confess that Jesus is 
Lord. Lord means boss. Yes, it means God, but it also means boss. He's in charge. He sits on the throne. He tells us what it is we do. He tells us in every area of his life. By the way, if you say, well, I want to come to Christ, but I want to keep him out of this area of my life or that area of my life, good luck with that. Because let me tell you, Jesus, when he comes in, he's the boss. He says, oh, by the way, I'm in charge of that too. Oh, yeah, I'm in charge of this. Oh, you didn't think I was in charge of that. I'm in charge of that too. He is Lord of all. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is Lord of all. So when we come to Jesus, we take ourselves off the throne of our heart. Third characteristic I want you to see is this. Following Jesus means following him to death. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. In the same way that we can't hear that phrase without thinking about the death of Jesus. The first hearers couldn't have heard this phrase without thinking of death. And the first readers could not have heard this without thinking of the death of Jesus. You going to follow me? Anyone can. But I want you to understand you're taking up your cross. What does it mean to take up your cross? When they would crucify uh, criminals, they would take the cross beam of the cross and put it on their shoulders and have them carry it through town. It was part of their punishment. So you go from the place of condemnation to the place of death, and then everyone sees you. And pe people would, it was like a parade. People would line the streets, and they, would, they didn't even know what you'd done. They would just hurl insults at you and condemn you, and there's guilt and shame. And so now you're identified as this criminal. Everybody knows it. And part of the punishment was that it was so public. And there was a lot of shame involved. So taking up a cross speaks of two things. First, it speaks of suffering. Simply to carry a cross of suffering. To endure the public shame of identifying with Jesus. You know, as we think about that, I don't want to be shamed. I don't want to feel shamed. I don't want people to shame me. We have to remind ourselves of who we are following. And that as Jesus was shamed, as Jesus was condemned then we too, at times, many times, will be shamed and condemned because we follow in the very footsteps of Jesus. It's just part of the Christian life. But it also means very real suffering. In fact, for many Christians reading this, the cross metaphor uh, was not really a metaphor. It was reality. Many of the first readers of this were facing the, the persecution of Nero. Nero was, uh, most people think, insane, and he targeted his insanity and hatred towards Christians at one point and said, hey, if they like this crucified Messiah so much, then why don't we crucify them? And he crucified untold thousands of Christians just simply for being Christians. So imagine reading this for the first time and you're confused about why Christians are being crucified and suddenly your eyes hit the page and you hear this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. When you are marching to your own death, carrying the cross beam on your shoulders of your own crucifixion, you are following in the very footsteps of Jesus and this is what it means to follow Jesus. It means to follow him to death for us the threat of actual death is not as real but the threat of shame is very real and the need to die to self is also very real the need to be willing to lay down your life is very real you know Galatians 2 20 Paul says this I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live I laid it down I am a dead man, Paul says. He says it again, Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ have been baptized into his death? When Jesus died, we died too. That's what it means to come to Christ. When you come and you lay your life down, you surrender it all, you are laying your life on the cross with him. You are tying your life with his in such a way that you're saying, I am now dying. I am taking up this cross of death means that. Second, it means, uh, speaks of death. Second, it speaks of mission. Jesus had one mission on earth, to die for the sins of mankind. He did many good things, many auxiliary things, if you will. He, he fed the, the hungry. But if Jesus' mission was to feed the hungry, he missed a lot of people. He healed a lot of people. But if Jesus' mission was to heal all of those who were sick, then he missed a lot of people. That wasn't his mission. 
His mission wasn't even to do some good teaching. No, his mission was to die on the cross. And in the process, he healed people and he, um, he taught and he fed people. What he did was he showed us what the kingdom of God is like. He said, here's what it's like. This is what the kingdom of God is like. When I'm around, there's nobody that's hungry. There's nobody that's sick. Everybody understands God's law perfectly. This is what the kingdom of God is like. I'm giving you a little picture of it while I'm here on this mission, headed to the cross to die for the sins of mankind, to be the substitutionary death for anyone who will believe. Believe. That was his mission. So if we are to follow Jesus, then we're to deny ourselves. Our own mission dies, and we take up our cross, our mission. Now, two things about our mission. One is our mission is not the mission of Jesus. There's only one person who can die for the sins of mankind. He's already done it. But second, our mission will be a path of suffering. It'll be a path filled with joy, but it'll also be a path of suffering. If part of your mission is serving in preschool, it will be filled with joy. But there'll be a little bit of suffering in there, and I apologize for the part that comes from my children and the suffering that comes. So there's, a, there's, a, there's always suffering attached to our mission. We as followers of Christ don't get to walk through the world unscathed by suffering. In fact, there are many ways Hear me, I want to be clear as Jesus is. I don't want to sell you a bait and switch here. I want you to understand that it will be because you follow Jesus many times that you will suffer. That if you were not following Jesus, that you could turn away from that particular suffering. But because you're following Jesus and because you will not turn back with your face set forward following your Messiah, you will step into suffering precisely because of that. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We cannot live for Christ and for ourselves. One has to go. One has to die in our lives. And Jesus calls us to die to self. It just won't work. So I want to be very clear about this. Jesus is calling us to lay down all that we have, all that we are, to surrender completely for him. And it is not just for the super Christians. Please don't make the mistake of thinking, well, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, and that's good. And, boy, I know some folks in our church who've really done that. I'm so glad for them. And, man, they really live that surrendered life. And I'm so glad that they do it so that I don't have to. No, it doesn't work like that. This is the call. This is what he has called us to. Lay it down. If you have not surrendered completely to Jesus, then listen carefully to this. To be a Christian is to be a disciple. To be a disciple is to die to self. So if you've not surrendered completely to Jesus, if you have not died to self, then maybe you're not a disciple. And if you're not a disciple, it doesn't mean you're not a super Christian. It means you're not a Christian. So we've got to be so careful about saying, yeah, I signed up for like the basic plan. I know there are other people who sign up for the all-in plan. I just stick with the basic plan. There is no basic plan for Jesus. When, look, look, when Jesus puts the contract out, you look at the contract, he says, I want the house, I want the car, I want your, I want your retirement, I want, your, I want every day, I want the mornings, I want the afternoons, I want the night, and, and, I, and, and I'll get this back one day. No, no, you just sign it all over. That is the contract that he lays out there. It is surrender. When you and I surrender, think about the word surrender. In fact, we've moved away from the word surrender and we've moved to the word accept. We want to accept Jesus. And there's nothing wrong with accepting Jesus. Certainly, we should not reject Jesus. We should accept him. But we need to listen to what, we've, what we say. We say, oh, accept Jesus, accept Jesus. As if we're the judge and we go, mm, ah, yeah, maybe I'll accept him. But the old preachers used to say surrender. They didn't call you to come forward and accept Jesus. They called you to come forward and surrender give it all up. What is surrender? Surrender is I'm raising the white flag. I'm putting my weapons down. I am in such a place where I have nothing to barter with. I have no way to negotiate. I just simply say I give up and I am at the mercy of the person I surrender to. They will do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. They are now in charge. Surrender. That's what he calls us to. Every one of us. There are five characteristics in this passage. We've heard three. Let's look at the last two. By the way, let me stop at this point. If this were like a gym membership and I had laid it out to you, you'd be like, I think I'll find another gym. You know, I, gotta, I don't know about this. But this is not where it ends. I want you to hear these last two clearly. 
The first of these last two is this. The goal of following Jesus is to become like Jesus. Yes, deny yourself, take up your cross, but follow me. What does that word follow mean? It carries a specific meaning with it. It is to follow a rabbi as his learner and his disciple. It's to take on the teachings of the rabbi and even the character of the rabbi. It is uh, saying, I want to enter into a formal relationship where you're identified with me and I'm identified with you. This is the same word that Jesus used for some of his followers when he said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Like, come and become uh, uh, attached to me, identified with me, come be like me. Come be shaped by my teachings and be shaped by my character in so much that you would actually become like me. You know, there's this great verse, Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the likeness of his son. And you know, we get so tripped up on the first part of that verse that we miss what it's actually saying. For those God foreknew, he predestined. Well, did he predestine them first or did he foreknow them first? I'd like to discuss this for a good two millennia and we can still argue about it. And we get so caught up on that part of the verse that we miss what it is actually saying. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the likeness of his son. Let me tell you what that means First Baptist Tillman's Corner. If you are a disciple of Christ, then God has determined that you will be like Jesus and there is nothing that will stop it. That is an incredible promise. That God will shape us and mold us into the very character of Jesus. Into the very character of the, of the great Son of God who loved himself and gave himself for us. I mean, that is an incredible promise. You and I, it is already settled in heaven. Amen. And it's been settled before the foundations of the world. It is written. God has said it. God has spoken it. God has determined it. And as sure as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, you and I, if we follow Jesus, will be like him. Man, so why, why would we take ourselves off the throne? Why would we follow him to death? Because the reward is that we would become like him. Even in that statement, you hear it, don't you? You hear Jesus' own life. Deny himself, take up his cross. That's Jesus' life. I don't matter. I'm putting what I want to the side and I'm submitting to the Father's will. I'm willing to be obedient to death, even the death on a cross. I mean, that's what I'm willing to do, Jesus said. And Jesus did it and he lived it out. And so as we follow him, how would we think that we wouldn't follow down a similar path? But it leads us to be shaped in a similar way. We become like Jesus. There's a fifth characteristic. Before I get to the fifth characteristic, I want to say that if it weren't for this characteristic, even being shaped into the image of Christ, what good is that if it's only death? If it's only a pathway to death? Oh, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. What good is it to be a good, outstanding human being if it ends in death? But the fifth characteristic makes all the difference. The fifth characteristic following Jesus is this. Following Jesus means following him to life. There is no path to true life that doesn't go through death. For followers of Jesus, there is no loss without redemption. There is no sacrifice without reward, and there is no death without life. How can you be so sure, pastor, that that's what Jesus meant? Because Jesus didn't stop talking in Mark 8, 34. He went on to Mark 8, 35. For whoever, why would you do this? Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Why would you do this? For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the gospels will save it. And that's what the New Testament tells us over and over again. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live. But he doesn't stop there. He says, the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I went through, yes, Paul says, I went through spiritual death. I died with Christ on the cross. But I died with him on the cross so that I'd be raised with him in the resurrection. 
Then Romans 6, 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Verse 4 says this, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. I don't have anything against Methodists or Presbyterians or anything like that, but I want, to, I want you to know that's why we're Baptists, because we baptize people. We put them all the way under and we bring them all the way out. Why? Because we see that that is what happens to us when we are saved. We are right there with him and we die with him and we are buried. But then we come back. Buried with him in his death and raised to walk in new life. Every time we see a baptism, uh, we're getting ready to do baptism next week. Every time we see a baptism, we should celebrate. Why? Because we should celebrate what Jesus did for us. He was died, uh, killed, he was buried, he was raised again. But we should also celebrate because of what is happening in that person's life. It's a testimony to what they've done. They've been crucified with Christ. They no longer live, but Christ lives in them. They're raised from the dead and they're raised to walk in new life. There is no death that doesn't lead to life for a Christian. There is no loss that doesn't lead to redemption. And I want you to really think about this because when we sing, like we've sung this morning, and we'll sing in just a moment, when we sing, I want you to know what you're singing about. You're singing that for a follower of Christ, there is nothing that can, that can be burned to the ground, down to ashes. It can be burned down to ashes in your life. It's burned down to ashes. And you know what the Bible says God does with ashes? He reaches down and he builds them up into something beautiful. You, If it's God's and you've given it to him, the, the enemy, the world cannot even burn it down because God will resurrect it and make it beautiful. There is nothing that dies in your life that the God of heaven will not breathe new life into. That is the promise of being a Christian. We do not die for death's sake. We don't, self, um, we don't take ourselves off the throne for, for uh, some kind of sacrificial sake. No, the sacrifice has already been made. It was made through Jesus. We follow a Savior who, yes, died but was raised to life. So, too, everything in our lives that we think we have lost will be gloriously resurrected, redeemed, and renewed by the Father. You know, there are these things called prosperity gospel preachers. And they tell you that if you'll follow Jesus, you'll have the nicest car in the neighborhood. If you follow Jesus, you'll have the nicest house in the neighborhood. If you follow Jesus, you won't ever get sick. The only people who have the nicest car in the neighborhood, the nicest house in the neighborhood, are them because they tell you to send their money, right? That's it. That's how it works. That's the game. Oh, I'm driving a nice car because I've been faithful to God. No, you're driving a nice car because you're, you're fleecing the flock. You're lying to people, and you're getting their money, and then you're buying your nice car. But here's the thing about prosperity gospel preachers. We go, oh, well, they promise way too much. No. They promise way too little. They've taken things that God has said, has God has never promised, they said, oh, God promises you a nice new car. God promises you a nice new house. God promises this. God promises that. And God has not promised us those things. But oh, what he has promised. And I'm telling you this. You can take your new car and you can have it. You know what I want? I want the eternal redemption of what I've placed in the hands of God. You can take your new house. You can have it. What I want is I want to look back on all those moments in my life. And 10,000 years from now, I want to look back and say, God, I didn't understand. And I want the Lord to open my eyes. And I want to see how little by little, piece by piece, God was building that into an eternally beautiful picture that will never fade. That house will fall apart. That car will fall apart. But 10,000 years from now, follower of Christ, I am telling you that you will praise God for your deepest, darkest moments because you will see in eternity how he has redeemed them into something beautiful. And that is the promise that he has given us from Genesis to Revelation. And he has fulfilled at every turn of history for his people. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. And follow me. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But those who will lose it will find it. Now I want to go back to where we started. Follow your blockers. You, you find that guy and you follow him. And he'll clear the way for you. Now, here's the thing. Some of the blockers I had cleared the way for me. Some of them didn't. That's just the reality of it. Some of them missed their blocks. Some of them just got pancaked, and I got tackled anyway. Follow your blockers. But as I was preparing this sermon this week, I, 
couldn't help but think about what Jesus is calling us to do here. Hey, you get behind me and you just follow me. Death, I've already been there. Life, I've already cleared the way. The grave, it's out of the way. Sin, done for. Whatever it is in your life, Jesus has already cleared the way. Somebody came up to me after the first service and they said, I couldn't help but think about this, Pastor. I couldn't help but have this visual of you running, you know, running down the field and Jesus is your lead blocker and he turns around and he says, don't fear, I have overcome the world. There's nobody on this field I can't block and nobody on this field I won't block. You follow me and it leads to life. Jesus has gone before us. Jesus has made the way for us to find life. But I want you to understand in the same way that there is no death for a follower of Jesus that doesn't lead to life, I want you to hear me clearly. Hear me clearly. This is maybe the most important thing you will hear in this entire sermon. There is no true life that does not require death. You can't run around this process You can't just come to church and play the game and go to the group and and, and sign the thing and do the baptism. You can't do it and go, well, I got it. I didn't want to do that death thing. That that death thing sounds hard. I didn't want to do the surrender thing, but that surrender thing sounds hard. There is no life that does not require death. Death to self, death to pride, death to your rule over your own life. God calls us to surrender. He calls us to a place like this. He calls us to an altar where we will come and say, God, I give up. I am your prisoner. I've been your enemy. I'm sorry, and I'm your prisoner. I am completely at your, your disposal. You do whatever you want to with me. That's what God calls us to. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. Let go of yourself. You, you don't even exist anymore. You deny yourself. And then you know what God does? He calls us to that moment of surrender. But the Bible says he is the lifter of our heads. And I love that picture because I love that picture of you come and you say, I surrender. It's all yours. And what, is, what does Jesus do? He reaches down and he says, get up off the ground. You are not my enemy. You are my daughter. You are my son. That's what he does for us when we come to him. But we can't get there without coming to that point of surrender. God will not have us come to him and say, I'm here to be a part of your family and here are my terms. He won't have it. And we come to him and we say, whatever it takes, God, I'm yours. And we surrender. Would you bow your heads? Lord, you have laid out for us in this passage such a clear call, a clear opportunity For all of us, those who grew up in church, those who this is their first day in church, Lord, you have given it to all of us. So those who are watching online who are not even sure what this whole church thing is all about, God, you have extended this incredible invitation to come, deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow you. God, I pray you would give us the strength to be obedient to that call. And I pray it in Jesus' name.